Apple and NVIDIA join forces to change the world. Welcome to All Future, where we talk all things Apple, tech, AI, various topics throughout the week. Uh, I think we just passed 6,000 subscribers, so big thank you to Woo! everyone 6, for subscribing. 000. That's a good number, man. I yeah. feel good about that. That's on, that's on the way, especially because I feel like last week we were like, oh, thanks for 5,000 subscribers. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, pretty good pretty good pace, guys. Thanks. Yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for watching. We're going to keep making these videos throughout the week, talking about all these topics. And if you haven't subscribed, consider it. If you give us a chance, um, always helps out with everything and helps us to keep making these videos. So today we're talking about Apple partnering with NVIDIA. I think at this point, it's kind of like insert company partner with NVIDIA. Sure. Yeah. And you could write an article <laughs> yeah, about yeah. it because it's going to happen. They're just so far ahead with everything AI and AI compute and all of the technology that they're implementing with this. And it's really clear that all of these things we're seeing from ChatGPT, Google, even Apple, they're using NVIDIA. Tesla, same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really interesting to see all the stuff going on right now between them and Apple and the particular partnership, especially with the Apple Vision being the headset that NVIDIA is using in a lot of their demos. Yeah, now super cool. And yeah, yeah. I, to your uh, kind of opening salvo there, you're like, yeah, if you're a company in the world and you're not partnering with NVIDIA, ugh, you're, you're probably messing up. But I think <laughs> like, AMD is just now talking about their kind of AI chips way behind on it. Mm-hmm. NVIDIA very close to surpassing Apple as the second most valuable company in the world. They're like uh, like a couple point trillion off or something like that. I think, you know, so a few billion dollars mm-hmm. in market cap and they'd be the, the second most valuable company in the world. So obviously doing a lot of stuff, generating a lot of hype. This thing, we've talked about this before, but the kind of this partnership that uses the uh, Apple Vision is basically making a virtual world using NVIDIA chips and AI that you can then see through the Apple Vision to do things and plan and affect the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, And in this case, they talk about designing factories and all the benefits with that. You're an Apple Vision guy, as famously on this podcast. You're the (laughs) Apple Vision guy. (laughs) So uh, that should be just your little thing at the bottom of the screen. Uh You should just say Apple Vision guy. Yeah. So you use it uh, personally. Mm -hmm. So it's a personal use device for you. Uh, do you see, is this the secret sauce that Apple needs to really break out with this thing? Is make it inter- integral to these kind of AI, generative AI, I don't want to say metaverse stuff, but the virtual world stuff? Mm-hmm. I think it definitely goes a step beyond any other headset just because of the quality. So the pass-through being so good that you can be in a physical space and look around, which the demos we see of, I think it's called Blackwell AI is the thing that NVIDIA is working on, where it designs factories and it can even like be iterating on a factory that's existing and you're, you put on the headset and can see where everything is and see it actually operating in real time. And that kind of thing, if it's a lower quality image in the headset, it's just not going to be as good. And the Apple Vision has that as well as the processing power to be able to pull this stuff off in those demos we've seen. So I think at least right now, that's what the Apple Vision is. And it could definitely break out a lot more in past consumers to actual companies buying these things for all of their employees to be using for designing different things like that. But I will say it is probably just a function of how good the quality of the headset is, less what Apple is specifically doing with it. Mm -hmm. You know, like if uh, Meta comes out with a 4K resolution headset on each eye, or Sony does the same thing, and it's able to run these things, then it probably could be just you choose your headset and then you're doing this NVIDIA Blackwell AI thing. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that Apple has to be the company, but at least right now, it's the only one available that can do it on that scale. Right. And then, you know, it, I would think you can't really discount the value of uh, industrial use of tech to eventually make it a better consumer product. I think, I think there's a great argument you can make that you know, business people and government using Blackberries is what kind of made the smartphone market. And, and and you can make all this argument you want about is the iPhone the first real smartphone? Eh, probably. Like I, I, but there's a direct path between people getting used to a device in your pocket that can do email, surf the web, do more than just be a cell phone, and a business and government adapting that thing at scale, which mm-hmm. was the Blackberry for the most part. And then Apple going, 
oh, well, we can actually take what these people are doing and make it in the consumer version of it, and then it's just off to the races after mm-hmm. that. So that's why I, I'm, I'm a fan of AR stuff, even though I'm not a Vision Pro owner. That should be my thing at the bottom, not, not a, Vision a Vision Pro, Pro <laughs> owner. But I do still, I like the, the concept of it. Mm-hmm. It's just right now it's a hard sell for the average person. This thing yeah. is expensive. This thing, it, the use cases at home aren't super clear to people. But the use cases in the industrial world, I think, are very clear when you look at something like this and what NVIDIA is doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they showed a video of them using the Apple Vision in this Blackwell demo. And it's really interesting to consider it like shows the circular nature of AI development because they're actually creating a digital twin factory in like the Omniverse, but it's to build the next generation of AI chips. And then this is being tested in that way. And then they'll build the factory and then they'll be using that next generation chip to build the future yes. chip in the Omniverse. I think we're going to start seeing this more and more. It's kind of this symbiotic relationship between, I'm not, I refuse to say Omniverse. What this is insane, yeah, it's the right? term they, I know, I know. It's like I'm the, sorry, I'll stop. You've got to pick like these marketing <laughs> terms for these things. I hope we settle on something better than any of this. Uh, I what would have been called in 1995 cyberspace, right? Yeah. <laughs> like whatever. Well, let's just go cyberspace. Cyberspace. So yeah, so the, the, the kind of... Uh, the relationship between our world and the world of cyberspace is going to start being more and more circular like that, where uh, virtual things are impacting real things that are creating things that are impacting virtual things. And it's just going to Mm -hmm. cycle like that, which is what you see in almost any kind of system uh, that is developed, right? That's what a system is, is different things interacting that are producing some kind of result. And so I think that's really cool. And there's so much cool application of that stuff because the the other thing like the warehouse stuff this is like immediate this seems very cool the other thing nvidia just showed is this weather modeling system yeah um which they call earth 2 which i think is a better name than omniverse let's just call the virtual space earth 2 (laughs) (laughs) um and it's basically doing uh super advanced weather modeling using generative ai at a resolution that previously we just could not do yeah which is really cool and i think you combine that with some AR stuff, right? Like, and, and just the, like I said, the combination of that real world information affecting virtual information, affecting real world information, you can actually make something that's really practical and helps a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And like a, right now you might watch a video like this and think like, Oh, why are we doing modeling for mm-hmm. weather? Shouldn't mm-hmm. it be more ac- like something we're not like guessing in that way, mm-hmm. but that is what we do. It's modeling <laughs> right now, and it's just getting it down to I think two kilometers instead of twenty five is what they said in the video. Yeah. So like yeah, previous kind of predictive weathering model is looking at like a twenty five kilometer resolution, meaning that weather happening at a smaller scale than that it can't really predict, and also factors that happen at a smaller scale than that it can't really predict. So you look at things that. Uh, massively affect weather, right? Water temps, things like that, uh, high, low pressure and where the, where they actually are. These are things that you need to get kind of that, that two kilometer resolution to really see how they're going. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the famous, like, you know, a a butterfly flaps its wings in China and then it rains in Tibet or whatever, you know, like, you know, Mm -hmm. it talks about all these kind of things, how small things affect the larger system. And so we need better resolution to be able to really, really predictively model this. Yeah. And that's what this is doing using generative AI. And they talk about wanting to, to get it down to hyper local stuff, like yeah. a, a matter of, you know, tens of meters instead of a couple thousand meters is, is kind of where they're at right now. So very cool. And is it a, when I first saw this though, and even using the phrase earth too, that immediately started to make me think of these kind of sci-fi kind of AI modeling using super advanced like quantum computing and things like that where you can get super active predictive stuff at a really low scale, mm-hmm. you know? So black mirror type stuff where you can like start to predict like human interactions and things <laughs> like that. Although I think yeah. things like weather, probably one of the first applications of this, I uh, have no doubt that people are u- looking at this model and then how it's built and then trying to apply it to financial markets, you know, mm-hmm. and, and try to figure out how to predict things like that predicting the future has been a goal of humanity for a very long time like like uh, we used to whatever you know uh look at bird signs or throw bones in a fire or whatever we're doing we've been on this chase to know what's coming up for a very long time and now we're actually starting to we've built this tech that's gonna get pretty good at it i think yeah and then it's going to show us all further that time is an illusion. But uh, anyways... <laughs> That's uh, a, yeah, time doesn't exist, so who cares? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in, 
it is interesting seeing NVIDIA partnering with so many people and then like their chips and how quickly they're advancing. Because mm-hmm. right now they're working on their Ruben chip, yep. I think is their next one they're and talking I, I about. I feel like they just announced, they. this is, we talked about their previous generation chip on this podcast. Yeah, a couple so, of months and, ago. Yeah, we haven't been doing this podcast mm-hmm. that long and they're already like, oh, forget that. We got something even better yeah. coming up. And they're apparently, I mean, that seems quicker than a one-year refresh, but they're apparently going for a like hardcore one-year refresh cycle on all their chips with massive improvement each time. So there's a lot going on there. And then there's the side of things where robotics comes into play. So I, Apple actually has talked about a humanoid robot yep. or... You talk about t- robotics, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they've there's rumors that they're working on a humanoid robot, or at least looking into it for the future. And a lot of companies are doing this. And one company that is working on their own robot again now is OpenAI. So we've seen OpenAI partner with Figure One on their robot that was talking using ChatGPT, and mm-hmm. it was really interesting to see that demo. Probably one of the best speaking demos we've seen. As, as someone who has seen all of these robotic demos <laughs> over the last few months, this is absolutely the one I was the most impressed with, mm-hmm. like hands down. Like I was like, oh, like this seems like that sci-fi level robot we always talk about. Like, yeah. it's, its ability to use natural language, its ability to reason uh, was, I think, incredibly impressive. Yeah. So OpenAI apparently in the past had a robotics research team team and stopped it, and now they're restarting that research team basically to make their own hardware. I think is the goal here. Yeah. Well, the the problem. Oh, look, and I can. OpenAI has this struggle within themselves to figure out who they are as a company right now, and are they the uh, this kind of I don't know egalitarian? We're just trying to build this technology betterment of the world kind of thing. Uh, or are they a company that's going to make products to make money? Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems like, especially if you listen to kind of what Sam Altman wants to do, the CEO, he much more leans toward, hey, we got to make something. We got to make something, or this doesn't matter. And you can see that in Chat GPT becoming a more and more consumer level product, especially with 4.0 and mm-hmm. these uh, different apps and stuff. That, and there's and the, the integration they're partnering with with other people. And if you look at when their robotics team was canceled, 2021. Kind of right before everything blew up, <laughs> like yeah. they, like those guys that got laid off from that were probably like, "Come on, if we'd had six more months, we'd had unlimited money." Mm-hmm. And so now, GPT, Chat GPT or OpenAI rather has uh, a lot more resources available, both from their own money and from these other companies that want to partner with them. And I think they're starting to see through things like Figure what this tech could do, and they're like, "Oh, like maybe this is our path to." really making something that we can sell and that's putting our software inside some kind of robotic system. Yeah. And I think it's absolutely possible and smart to jump in right now because we saw it with Tesla and the Optimus robot Mm. that came about kind of quickly. Like everyone kind of laughed because they did a demo, like a thing on stage where they announced the Tesla bot and then it someone in just a suit came on stage mm-hmm. and like danced mm-hmm. and it was like kind of supposed to be a joke but kind of kind of made like fun, of making fun of themselves your own product like, yeah uh, this is a bad way to do pr but yeah. yeah but within a few months from there i think they had actually a working demo and it's been a couple years now but they actually it's growing a lot of functionality and it's walking around the factory and able to do all these tasks so it's like if open uh open ai jumps in right now they could absolutely do the same kind of thing within probably a year or so. And if you look at the culture over there at, at, and what they're kind of doing, it's a, we're going forward kind mm-hmm. of culture, right? They're like, oh, like, let's just make stuff, right? Like, like we're like, uh, it kind of that old Silicon Valley adage, like, uh, uh, it, you know, fail quickly kind of stuff mm-hmm. or move fast and break things, whatever. And there's all kind of dumb little sayings people yeah. use for it. But that seems to be the kind of uh, culture they've built over there is like, Let's start making stuff, especially since all their safety people have resigned. So uh, <laughs> nothing holding them back from making uh, killer robots now. And yeah, like I could see them looking at how fast they were able to progress with large language models and go, oh, well, if we take this mentality and put it toward robotics, how fast could we go then? Mm-hmm. Probably very fast <laughs> is, Probably is, so, yeah. is the question. Yeah. So it always raises this question of what that means for Apple and OpenAI partnering in the future. Now, at this point, it's actually not confirmed that those two are partnering. We've kind of just accepted it as truth <laughs> that it's going to happen and that they're going to announce stuff at WWDC, but we don't actually fully know at this point if they're partnering. But if OpenAI were heavily working on robotics, I could definitely see Apple they're already going to be partnering with them on the iPhone. If that comes true, 
then they could definitely be partnering with whatever their future humanoid robot form sure. thing I, is. I, OpenAI almost has their kind of choice of who they want to partner with with this mm-hmm. stuff. No, I think everyone's going to take their calls at least, right? Like, yeah. you know, everyone's going to, if they're interested in working with someone, that company's going to be like, yeah, sure, let's talk about it, right? Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but uh, let's at least hear what they have to say. And I think there's probably a lot of benefit thinking about an Apple partnership with hardware, mm-hmm. right? No one does hardware better than Apple. That, that has been true for a long, long time. You could argue that's been true since 1977 when they made the Apple II, right? Like, like Apple hardware is, for the most part, better designed, more intuitive. People want it. People think of it as kind of a, a covetable object and not mm-hmm. just some like a toaster or something utilitarian around them, right? So if you want to make a robot that people want, Apple seems like a pretty good pretty good people to talk to at least. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And seeing how the Apple Vision has come about, we know that robot will probably be extremely expensive at launch, but also probably <laughs> extremely good. Yeah. Probably the best form of that product mm-hmm. as long as the software is there to back that up. Yeah, especially since Apple's sitting there with all those guys from the car team they're like, hey, why don't you guys mm-hmm. go talk to these open AI guys and let's build some robots. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm very curious to see, though, going forward, what kind of partnerships we see. I think we're going to see Apple openly partnering with more companies than we've kind of seen them in the past. They like to vertically integrate, and they're going to be doing that with AI stuff. But these companies are so ahead that we're going to see them continue partnering with NVIDIA, with things like the Apple Vision and whatever future iterations that could be. And then as well as OpenAI and all that stuff. For sure. And this is, I mean, you say like, oh, it's, uh, Apple's not really known for this. Like I say, modern Apple's not known for this that much. I mean, it was Apple the last 10 years or something. But Apple, if you look at the launch of the iPhone, right? Apple was very willing to partner mm. with Google to make that thing work, yeah. right? Apple's very willing to partner with... Singular at the time, yeah, right? Yeah, Singular, all that for to actually sell it, right? So like, Apple has made a lot of big partnerships with other companies. I, I I don't carry this around in my bag with me, but on, on the podcast, I brought up my HP made iPod, you know, yeah. like they partnered with HP because it made sense for them. So I could see them looking at AI robotics in that same kind of vein. It's like, hey, like we got something pretty good, but we need some help really putting it over the top. And you could argue that the iPhone would have been kind of a failure without those Google partnerships mm-hmm. because it, Two of the big things of the original iPhone was the YouTube video player and, uh, and Google Maps. Mm-hmm. So that that's really two of the things that made people go, oh, wow, this is really nice. Yeah. You know, the only killer app that Apple had was Safari on there, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, we have mobile Safari and then two things made by Google. That's what really made that thing work. Yeah. So the future of Apple might lie with the Omniverse, which is a word you seem to love. I, I can't wait to be a citizen of the Omniverse. <laughs> <laughs>